Can just come on in order. Around. Well, just okay, we're good. a scent, Larry. Merci. Bonjour. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour une conférence de presse au sujet de la maladie de Lyme à cause de mon projet de loi, de loi pour euh, mettre sur pied un cadre euh, au niveau fédéral euh, euh, au, au, relatif à la maladie de Lyme. Euh, à ce moment, actuellement, nous avons un ébauche. C'est seulement un ébauche. Euh, grâce à Dieu, c'est seulement un ébauche parce qu'il manque le, le niveau d'engagement de pour faire une différence dans les vies des Canadiens et Canadiens qui souffrent avec la maladie de Lyme. Hello, uh, I'm here just to coordinate the beginnings of this press conference. We're honored to have with us experts on the issue of Lyme disease, as well as parliamentary colleagues, Dr. Kelvin Ogilvy and Tracy Ramsey. Tracy is the NDP critic. Uh, Francesco Sorbero, please join us up here. So we, this is a nonpartisan press conference. So the opposition parties and a, a, we, and a liberal member of parliament speaking to the issue of why the framework must be improved. In, in order, just to save time, I'm going to introduce all three in order now. So you'll hear from Rosanna Magnota, who is president and founder of the Magnota Foundation for Vector-Borne Diseases. She will speak first, followed by Dr. Liz Zubek who is a family practitioner, uh, a family physician of what we call the Lyme literate physician community. And Dr. Mulaney Wills will be the last speaker of our experts, and then we'll turn to our parliamentarians. So starting with Rosanna Magnota. As the director of the Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation and as founder of and president of the G. Magnata Foundation for Vector-Borne Diseases, I am gravely concerned about the lack of scientific and medical ethic at the highest levels within the Public Health Agency of Canada. This unity came about due to thousands of Canadians from across the country telling their strikingly similar stories of abuse and neglect at the hands of the current health care system. Jobs were lost, marriages ended, Bankruptcy ensued, and quality of life became poor at best. In far too many instances, this tragedy ended in death, too often by suicide. There was such hope at the last May Scientific and Medical Conference held because of Bill 442. At the end of the conference, all felt that finally the process would become ethical and transparent. The legislation embodied openness. It did not state that a conference would be held and then collaboration would stop and a report written for Parliament by the very bureaucracy responsible for the bill in the first place. The official line given to many MPs and then passed on to their inquiring constituents is that there was plenty of consultation prior to the framework being drafted, such as the conference and an online survey done by Public Health Agency of Canada. That online survey was drafted behind closed doors, and if there had been collaboration with patients and their experts, it would have been a much different survey. The interpretation of the results of that survey was another closed day, another closed door undertaking that was so biased we had to insist that an outside third party became involved. Those same bureaucrats are now writing the framework behind closed doors. The draft of the framework was released in February, met none of the requirements of Bill 442, and had so many errors in scientific fact that we asked that it be rewritten, only this time with patient experts involved. That request was denied. We are now hearing from some MPs that there is a rush to accept this poor framework as, if, as it is just for the sake of having a framework. That is wrong on so many fronts. The bureaucrats are making a mockery of the legislation and the nearly half million dollars of your and my money spent on this framework so far. Only the Minister of Health can intervene and insist on patient experts being involved in the writing of the framework, even if that means delaying the report to Parliament. That would, that would be the correct and ethical thing to do. Thank you. Our Canadian government did something so impressive for people with Lyme disease. 
Bill C-442, also known as the Lyme Law, was passed unanimously with support from all parties. MPs across the country listened to the suffering caused by Lyme disease, and they mandated this collaborative conference held last May to bring together scientists and clinicians and researchers from Canada and from around the world. And we met with people who were, were affected by Lyme disease. Together, we offered some cutting-edge suggestions to better diagnose and treat Lyme disease in Canada. And then after all this collaboration, nothing happened. All our efforts and our input were ignored. And an action plan was created without our involvement that suggests that Canada should just stay with the status quo of test and treatment. Now, this action plan or, or draft framework tells me, as a doctor treating Lyme disease, that I should follow outdated guidelines that haven't been revised in over 10 years. Newer guidelines exist that take into account uh, the explosion of research in the past decade and which include patient input in their development. This draft framework also suggests that as a doctor, I should be satisfied with our Canadian testing for now and that maybe in the future there will be improvements. This is not acceptable. If you, as a Canadian, have Lyme disease and you go to your doctor, the test we have now will only pick it up maybe 40% of the time. Right now, in Europe, there are better tests that will pick it up 84% of the time. Canadians deserve better tests and better treatment. This is a devastating disease. We cannot just accept the current situation. I urge our, minister, our Minister of Health to reject the draft framework and insist on a real Canadian action plan. It's created in partnership with people affected by Lyme disease and those researchers and doctors who are actively on the ground treating them. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Melanie Wills. I'm the director of the Canadian Lyme Science Alliance, and I'm also affiliated with Mount Allison University and the University of Guelph. The speakers before me have done an outstanding job of articulating the circumstances that led to the creation of Bill 442. Suffice it to say that this act represents our earnest attempt to address the increasing burden of Lyme disease and the horrific patient suffering that results when it is not diagnosed and managed appropriately. It is an opportunity to question uh, whether the science has outpaced policy and critically reconsider how we view and treat this devastating illness. To that end, members of the clinical, academic and patient communities convened in 2016 to inform the creation of a comprehensive action plan to improve medical surveillance efforts, best practice guidelines and educational initiatives. The intention was to catalyze change and affect meaningful progress. Unfortunately, the draft framework fails to deliver on its promises. As a medical researcher in the field of Lyme disease biology, I am concerned by the lack of scientific rigor, collaboration, and leadership that is demonstrated in this document. The success of the framework depends on several key elements. Stakeholder investment and representation, a clear understanding of the issues, transparent and unbiased scientific evaluation of the relevant biomedical literature, a concrete agenda that will outline the steps that need to be taken to rectify the situation, and tangible deliverables that can actually address the inadequacies. The framework fails drastically in all of these areas. It does not provide a balanced, holistic, or current portrayal of the scientific evidence, nor does it capture the experiences and the needs of Canadians who are suffering from Lyme disease. Rather, it reads as a vague and unquestioning endorsement of the status quo, rather than a roadmap to a brighter future. This approach is both regressive and contrary to the essence of scientific advancement. Lyme disease treatment and research are historically fraught with controversy, and we at the CLSA believe that this division can only be overcome by dispensing with outdated, harmful dogma and approaching problems from a fresh scientific perspective that is informed by modern evidence and engages patients in an ethical and respectful way. We can 
and we must do better. Thank you. Of our parliamentarians, I'm going to start with Senator Ogilvy because he chaired the panel, the uh, health committee that dealt with Bill C-442, and then I'll go to Francesco and then to, uh, and then to Tracy Ramsey. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, and I want to acknowledge Elizabeth's leadership in attempting to bring this issue for, uh, to the fore in Canada. A country that is capable of uh, developing a treatment for, uh, for Ebola disease a world away certainly has the capacity to identify and develop appropriate diagnostic testing for a disease that exists in our country and a treatment thereof. It can no longer afford to have a health care system, a large part of which doesn't even recognize that this disease exists. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we're all here today because there was an incredible hope. There was hope, first of all, with the bill, then there was hope with the conference, hope for people across our country who have someone in their, in their life who is affected by Lyme or they themselves are. There was hope that something would come out of this that would change the way that Lyme disease is treated in Canada. And unfortunately, this framework fails to do that on such a dramatic level, uh, that the people in my writing of Essex have called it a betrayal. And so we're left with advocacy groups who have to continue to patch together health care for people that are impacted uh, because our system just simply doesn't address it. Um, when we're able to see pets in our country that are being treated and that have a pathway to health around Lyme disease, when people in our country don't, something is seriously broken. We can and we must do better. I have called upon the, the minister, and I know many other of my uh, colleagues have as well, uh, to please scrap this framework, start again, include families, include patients, include all of the, the voices, the amazing scientific voices, and the doctors that have been involved in this this, uh, in this treatment and really looking towards hope for the future in Canada where Lyme disease can be treated and people can be cured. I want to thank all of the experts and advocates and parliamentarians who joined us today to talk about the Lyme disease framework. Uh, I have met with Minister Philpott. I really am hopeful that she is continuing to be open to uh, input around what is missing here, what's not acceptable here. And this is, again, I want to stress a nonpartisan call, uh, but we, would, we did think it was important that the public at large that watched the Lyme framework, uh, watched Bill C-442 be passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. We had the, a long delay because of the federal election. The conference couldn't be held till May 2016. It was excellent. You've heard from our participants here today how much hope it engendered and how much scientific evidence was put forward, how much medical information was shared. And then we went into sort of a black box where someone else drafted this draft framework. And it's not acceptable. It can and must be improved. And that's why we wanted to be very open and public about where things stand right now and why that must change. Otherwise, even though it was five years ago practically to the day that I introduced first reading Bill C-442, we don't want the feeling and we don't want the reality that it's come to naught and that we are left with a status quo approach. We need to do better. And I couldn't have said it better than Senator Ogilvie did. If we can find a solution within Canada for Ebola, uh, we must pull ourselves to the challenge and, and challenge ourselves to meet the needs of Lyme disease patients across Canada. So we're open to questions to anyone, en français, en anglais, uh, but I, I'd be happy to sort of um, direct the questions to whomever, but it would be helpful if any journalists will direct the question to the person that they would like to have respond, so that we're now open for questions. Yes. Uh, what, what specifically would you like to see in this framework, whether it be funding or, or calls to action? Like well, it's, it's primarily a call to action. Uh, there is going to be new funding. I think it's very clear that the federal budget providing money for diseases and health impacts that are increased due to the climate change issue and the climate crisis, uh, it's certainly, I think, taken on board by the minister that this represents an opportunity. Lyme disease, as Bill C-442 says, is expanding in large part to our changing climate. So there's currently no place in Canada which where you could say, I'm in, a, I'm in a zone here where I can't get Lyme disease. That's 
And that's one of the big challenges to overcome. The framework, um, Dr. Ralph Hawkins from the University of Calgary, who's one of, uh, one of the witnesses and experts who was part of the May conference, uh, told a group of parliamentarians the other day that this draft framework for action was neither a framework nor action. So those pieces need to be put in. I think particularly around the diagnostic and treatment piece, one thing I'd like to see in the draft federal framework is an affirmative statement that any Canadian with Lyme disease has a right to treatment in Canada. We have, as, as you've heard from Rosanna, far too many cases of people who've lost their homes because they needed to find the funds to go south of the border to save a family member's life by going to the U.S. for treatment. That should not be the case in a country with the wonderful universal uh, access under the Canada Health Act. Canadians should be able to get treatment for Lyme disease in Canada. So the framework needs to address that. The framework language also needs to dispense with, uh, and I'm thinking it was Mulaney who used the word dogma, uh, the, the dogma around um, uh, the notion that there is a big open question around whether people can have symptoms of either, some people call it post-Lyme disease syndrome, some people call it chronic Lyme disease, whatever you want to label it, we need to face the reality that people who have had Lyme disease, and it, it particularly where it was not properly diagnosed, not treated early, have a lifetime of disability. We need to find uh, and we need to focus research and find ways to assist those people, whatever you want to describe as the condition uh, uh, that they are dealing with. Uh, the language doesn't matter. Focusing on it as a health emergency does matter. And this framework fails there. I'll open up the floor to this fundamental question. What is missing in the framework? Anyone want to jump in on that? Go ahead. <laughs> Um, from the perspective of the researcher, I would say that we don't have a comprehensive understanding, uh, at least put forward by the framework, of uh, what is the medical research that we should be considering. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there's an unquestioning endorsement of guidelines that are, I believe, 11 years old at this point. They don't consider the last decade of research. And as Dr. Zubek mentioned, there's been an explosion of research on this topic. So from my perspective, uh, let's get all of the research on the table. Um, if it's not on the table, give us a reason why uh, you've decided to exclude an entire uh, body of knowledge. Um, also, as, as uh, Ms. May mentioned, I think the funding for the research, we took the, the framework is, is full of uh, this sort of optimistic promise that we should be doing things, that we should be taking into consideration new research. Where is this new research coming from? Can we prioritize that? Excellent. Do you want, anyone else want to jump in on that, Dr. Zubek? Um, I think an important matter on the funding is that that we tie funding into um, things that are supported by the group affected by Lyme, that they are able to direct where the funding dollars go because we don't want to be spending millions of dollars looking at something that isn't pertinent to the lives of Canadians affected by Lyme. So there really needs to be at all levels that collaboration happening. Um, I just uh, don't know if it was actually covered, but I would uh, say that it needs to be um, a framework that has had input from not only the scientists, researchers, and doctors, but patients and their and their advocates, their experts need to be involved with this because we're on the ground level seeing this each and every day and we have a lot to offer to a framework that will benefit all Canadians. Just, I just want to add, you know, I, we, we've been... Uh, somewhat negative, I, I do want to say that the Public Health Agency of Canada has uh, been, it certainly was helpful when C442 was going through Parliament. The experts before the House and Senate committees made it clear that Lyme disease right now is the single largest, fastest growing infectious disease in Canada, that they recognize that we're going to be seeing thousands additional cases year on year, and we need to have the tools to address this. So the tools are, yes, everyone agrees on prevention and awareness. That's uncontroversial, and it needs to be dealt with, but that will also take funding, and that takes federal-provincial collaboration. We also need better surveillance. That seems to be relatively uncontroversial. Where the problem 
lies is how do you uh, create the kind of awareness within the medical community that a Canadian who shows up at their family doctors and says, I have this weird bunch of sy symptoms, how do we create the response that becomes immediate to think, could it be Lyme? What should I do if it is Lyme? And you also know, and I know this is very much on the minds of officials within Health Canada, how do we make sure that people don't jump to the conclusion it's Lyme if, in fact, it's multiple sclerosis or something else? So we've had a pattern over the last number of years where we've had people who've been misdiagnosed with MS when, in fact, they had Lyme. We don't want the pendulum to go the other direction and have people jump to the conclusion it's Lyme. There are a number, and I'm not a medical doctor, obviously, or a scientific researcher, but there are a number of diseases and uh, groups of symptoms that are very hard for a physician to diagnose. But the tragedy of Lyme is that if it's diagnosed quickly and, a and, and two or three weeks of antibiotics are prescribed, that person can be restored to complete health. But if it's misdiagnosed early, then you have potentially a lifetime of disability. So when you look at the balance here, if you misdiagnose um, multiple sclerosis and you miss a critical month or so, actually the treatment regime doesn't change much. But if you misdiagnose Lyme and miss a critical early opportunity for treatment, you've made a very, very serious error with the potential for patients to be disabled, uh, as I have in my constituency, young people uh, in wheelchairs, uh, uh, working healthy uh, father of a household with young kids who has had for the last eight years the inability to hold down a job, in fact, to go Christmas morning and saying, I was really hoping I could get from my bedroom to the living room to watch the kids open their presents. This is a devastating disease that is afflicting thousands of Canadians. And we need help. And I am counting on Dr. Jane Philpott because she is both a member of cabinet, she's also a compassionate human being, and she is herself a medical doctor, to find a way to say to the people within the health agency who drafted this that they have to go back to the drawing board. Yes, please do. Uh, one of the things that we shouldn't uh, make a mistake on, this is a complex disease. This is not a simple disease to diagnose correctly and it's in, in its various forms, which is why the strategy that Elizabeth has been proposing here, and you've heard from all of the experts here today, is so critical that it be a modern strategy that approaches it from a knowledge base in a modern context with the incredible research capability we have in this country. We have got to be able to diagnose the disease correctly and then immediately provide the appropriate treatments. Est-ce qu'il y a les autres questions? Any other questions? Je pense que maintenant je peux faire un petit résumé en français. C'est clair que les médecins, les experts et la communauté avec la maladie de Lyme autour du Canada ont besoin de plus que cette ébauche. C'est clair que nous avons maintenant les, euh, les recherches scientifiques, nous avons fait les progrès, mais ce n'est pas dans le, 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 le boches pour un cadre euh, fédéral euh, relatif de maladie de Lyme. Maintenant, cette ébauche, ce n'est pas suffisant. So we need to see the time taken to improve this. We've had a lot of hope, a lot of work, and a lot of experts bring forward their views. Last May, in the National Conference on Lyme that was presided over by Dr. Philpott and the Canadian Canadian Health Agency, former head of the Canada Health Agency, Dr. Greg Taylor, certainly gave us a lot of reasons to believe that this framework would reflect the latest scientific knowledge and much better guidelines than the outdated ones which are endorsed in this report. Uh, so we thank you for coming today. I thank all of you who've traveled so far to be here to support the uh, quite widespread nonpartisan uh, concerns of members of parliament and senators who want Bill 442 to result in the action that Canadians suffering with Lyme disease and those who will um, tragically uh, contact it in future, we all need to see this framework meet those expectations. Merci beaucoup. Wonderful to meet you. Very nice to meet you.
Thank you so much, Francesca. Nice to meet you. Yes. Yes. Very good job. Very good job.